I was excited about this dis very distinct American voice coming straight from Bath Spa University, uh, which I was A, like, what's a bath spa? Because I thought they were both the same thing. And two, I was just incredibly captivated by the humor that was on the page. Um, and then I had a chance uh, to meet Brian shortly thereafter. So what I think we should do is to make this as much of a conversation as opposed to a reading is we're just going to have Brian. See, I don't remember it that way. Oh, you really? called me and we had a 45 minute conversation. And we didn't talk about the book at all. Oh, that's my. Uh, <laughs> and the next day, my agent said, oh, he wants to make an offer. That's really funny. That's my style. I like to, you know. Well, Tim used to be a sushi uh, chef, and he crossed a lot of <laughs> national boundaries with his sushi knives and his luggage, and that's sort of what I remember. This is true, but I, I want to, the reason that I said this <laughs> was because, and this will, this will connect back to the book, was that I was astounded that there was someone writing about a sense of place who wasn't in that place. And I traveled a lot when I was, when I was younger, and I think we had a very common background, and I wanted to sort of sell you on that. Uh, my, my job as an editor at that point was like, listen, I get where you're coming from. Because um, I do love Americana, and again, you know, you're in the middle of, of the UK writing this, and you had been to the Czech Republic. I think we talked about Prague for a bit as well. Um, so that was why I said those things in that initial conversation. Um, Purely cynical manipulation. Oh, just, uh, <laughs> that's what publishing is, isn't it? <laughs> um, but why don't you start and introduce the book a bit and then read some from the first chapter. Okay. Um, uh, long after I had written it, uh, I kind of came to think of this book as the tale of a knight errant traveling through the fantastical realm of southern Indiana encountering various ogres and trolls and... Uh, and, and he has a trusty steed in the form of a pickup truck. And I don't know if it ever struck you that way. You're the one who called the Gypsy Moth a trusty steed. Um, but I'll just jump in on the first page, actually. Some old horses. I got my job by accident. A sycamore tree landed on the roof of my predecessor's 4x4 during a thunderstorm. He spent six months in a neck brace. He shouldn't have been in the car, said the boss, Gerald, during my interview. We work in all weather. Gerald is pigeon-toed with an aquiline nose and crow's feet around his hooded brown eyes, a caricature of an ornithologist. He even picks at his food. He's a Princeton professor now. Back then he was a PhD candidate surveying the effects of habitat fragmentation on neotropical migrant songbirds in south central Indiana. How did you get past that sentence? <laughs> A mutual acquaintance named Lola had introduced us. All Gerald wanted to know was whether I could read a topographical map and identify common trees. I said I could. Prove it, he said. We looked at a map together and took a stroll through the Indiana University Campus Arboretum, which was slightly unfair since they weren't common trees. But time was short, and with a success rate south of 50%, I still got the job. Memorize these, he said, removing an unmarked cassette from his shirt pocket. It was birdsong. That is what he listened to on his car stereo, too. And Nathan, he added, to be in the field by 5 a.m., you probably want to set your alarm for 4.30. Want is not the verb I'd have chosen. I was to work six days a week. I was lucky he didn't test me on other things I would need to know. Trigonometry, for example, or what to do when you're 12 miles from shelter and the sky turns soup green. Indiana doesn't claim the most tornadoes annually in the United States, just the deadliest. This is partly a function of the number of trailer parks and mobile homes scattered throughout the state. God hates white trash is the vile refrain you hear everywhere after a lethal twister. Lola, I said, how do you know Gerald? I had found it better not to ask Lola how she knew other men, but Gerald seemed a safe bet. He didn't have time for girls. He saved my starlings from my cat, she said. She had a nest in the eaves of the one bedroom house she rented. He lives next door. So they fledged, I said. She had showed the nest to me one morning after I had scrambled some eggs and she had brewed some coffee and we sat at a little table on her front porch. But she usually came to my house and I asked her about Gerald there over pancakes she had made. She used orange juice in the batter, which may seem counterintuitive but can't be beat. Virgil watched the nest for days, she said. Virgil was the cat. I dreaded it, but I didn't know what to do. Then one afternoon, this skinny bearded guy was hopping around in the yard with Virgil chasing him. He moved them to his yard and said the parents would do the rest if I could keep Virgil on my patch. 
But how did you get on the subject of the bird job, I said. He seemed sort of lost, she said. I thought he lived next door. I made him some banana bread to say thanks, she said. He just stood in the door blinking as though nobody ever gave him such a thing. That may have been accurate, but I suspected that he had never encountered anyone as lovely as Lola before. Her charm lay not in her husky voice or delicate face or fluid figure, but in the way that all these things reflected her intense and genuine pleasure in seeing you. I would like to make that seeing me, but she wasn't very discriminating. She had long coppery hair and freckled arms and calm blue eyes, but I think that was only when I looked at her. She could make herself instantly into anything you wanted to see. I pictured Gerald squirming under all the flattering attention she could put in a single glance. After that, he crawled back under his rock, she said. Of course. So I invited him over once. I had some friends around and I asked if he would like to join us. When was this, I said. I wanted to know which friends. She ignored the question. He didn't show and I got kind of bored with my party. Everyone talking about concerts they had been to. So I grabbed a couple of beers and slipped out. We sat on his front porch for almost an hour. That might be the longest Gerald ever sat in one place, I said. About once a week I go over and have beer on his porch, she said. We talk. Do you throw him toast in the morning? She scowled. She was not always honest, but she was never rude. I've only been in his house once, she said. He has a sofa and two bird books. That's all. I feel sorry for him. The last man Lola felt sorry for proposed to her. Still, Gerald was Gerald, and I didn't worry about that. On June 22nd of that summer, between 5 and 11 in the morning, I found 12 nests. That's more than most people accomplish in a lifetime. Two were Kentucky warblers and one was an oven bird. The females of both species are deeply crafty. Locating their nests is not a question of looking carefully around. You have to outsmart them. The male, off bragging somewhere, gives you some idea what territory they claim. Within that territory, the female is keeping an eye out for people like you, or foxes, raccoons, and hawks like you. You won't spot her on the nest. A Kentucky warbler is bright yellow, but her nest is partially enclosed, and an oven bird's camouflage is perfect, and she holds very still unless you get within six inches or so. Both are ground nesters. To a human eye, one reed or branch looks much like another, but she's on intimate terms with each of them. If you do spot the oven bird away from her nest, she pretends her wing is broken and hops along the nearest ravine, hoping you will follow. The Kentucky warbler is more sadistic. She doesn't feign injury, but she leads you away from the nest until you are ankle deep in mud or rattlesnakes or both. The only way you will find her nest is if she f shows you, and she won't show you if she knows you are there. It's like staking out the girl's shower block at summer camp. It can be done, but it takes skill. Gerald routinely reported more than 20 finds a day. For the first week, I just shadowed him. We walked into the forest, and abruptly, when I couldn't tell when or why, he would sit down on a convenient log and close his eyes. Gerald was very angular, with a scraggly red beard and a semi-hunched back. He reminded me of a garden gnome. After ten minutes, he would open his eyes and quietly announce that the Carolina chickadee I hadn't heard probably nested in the hickory stump I hadn't noticed on the way in, and at least four Acadian flycatchers were active in a nearby creek bed. He could tell what vegetation lay in which direction just by listening to which birds favored that area. At times I imagined that I didn't hear any birds at all, so loud was the sound of Gerald's calibrated brain absorbing and interpreting so much delicate information. The more familiar I became with the work, the more impressed I was with his mastery of it. And years later, with substantial experience under my own belt, I was never even a Watson to his homes. Um, thanks, Brian. That's, I, I love this part of the book actually so much, and I love those last... Uh, few passages when we get into the birds because I didn't know anything about birds when I read it or when it was submitted and I certainly didn't know anything about the Kentucky warbler uh, which I just find your description of it here so fascinating that that actually exists and um, I wanted to know how you how you came to learn uh, so much about birds originally well I don't um, <laughs> but I have it's Google. fiction right yeah <laughs> when I was um, the full story is that when I was in high school, this kid hit me really hard after I stole his bubble gum, and I woke up in the emergency room with a defective left ear. About seven years later, I got a strange job finding bird nests for Indiana University, and I wasn't very good at it because I couldn't hear where the birds were. Everybody else would say, oh, that one's over there, and, and I would just turn in circles. And <laughs> but I was so jealous of the people who were good at this job that 17 years later, I fabricated my own career as a bird nest tracker 
because the people who were good at it would go to New Guinea to f document new species and other romantic things like that. So why? So how much research did you do? How much latching on when you decided that you were going to create Nathan, and you sort of said, "Okay, here's an entryway into fiction through birds." Did you really start digging in and, and learning more from a from your time from a distance? No, uh, the things that happened to Nathan either did happen to me or to my partner, whose name, by the way, was Nathan. Um, <laughs> or to people who also did the same job. I certainly verified everything that I wrote and double checked and, and asked people who knew to make sure that I didn't get anything wrong. Right. But um, much later when you sent me on tour <laughs> and Josie set up uh, an opportunity for me to go on CBS Sunday morning, I froze. <laughs> they said, what's that burden of? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying not to millions of TV viewers. Um, so oh, that's funny. I'm happy we were able to give you that opportunity. <laughs> um, well, let's, I mean, I, I like this idea that, that Nathan and I imagine Lola, to some extent, they're sort of composites then, are these, the people that we meet, like your characters are particularly strong, and we'll get to another one later, um, who is only on the page for but a second, but has stayed with me for a long time. But it's one of your strengths, is, is the characters, and I just want to know, you know, are you building them from other people you've met throughout time? Yeah, and I'm not always aware of it. So uh, I, I went back to Indiana after writing the book, and I thought I had invented the character of Dwayne. And then I saw this guy who was, I thought, oops, I hope he doesn't read the book, because he'll recognize himself. Um, but I, I'm, I, you know, it's not always a conscious thing. Uh, most of the characters, most of the events and incidents are either made up or borrowed, but the the emotional arc of Nathan's anguished relationship with his home state is absolutely autobiographical. Could you just read the um, read the first two pages of Snapper because this this leaps off this discussion of character. Um, I think. I doubt. I, excuse me. I doubt anyone outside Southern Indiana knows what a stripper pit is. They don't exist anywhere else. This is sometimes embarrassing for me in conversation if I say I spent many happy adolescent hours there. People think I'm talking about Thong Thursdays at Fast Eddie's. The British Broadcasting Corporation once sent a reporter by boat to Evansville to investigate the wild ways of the inhabitants, the kind of thing they used to do in deepest Africa, I think. We are Hoosiers, after all. On a technical level, a stripper pit is what remains of a bituminous coal mine, but strip mining is not like other mining. Picture vast granite cliffs topped with coniferous trees, deep lakes of calm cerulean blue. Imagine a majestic Norwegian fjord somehow misplaced among rolling cornfields. That is what a stripper pit looks like. At the bottom of those lakes, you'll find old refrigerators and stolen cars and bags of kittens. It is southern Indiana. Before the mining company got to it, it was woodland or farmland or in some cases small towns. The beauty of strip mining, if you're a mining company, is that you don't have to dig for your coal. You just scrape everything off the top for several surrounding square miles. Then you scrape yourself a lucrative pit where the bituminous is piled deepest. Some people will tell you it's anthracite, but they're wrong. Even the coal around there is second rate. The only downside to this kind of operation is that even Hoosiers won't tolerate the total obliteration of the landscape for long. So if you were a strip mine in about 1973, you found yourself suddenly filled with water and stocked with fish. Your hillsides were covered in alien trees. The mining company was footing the bill, and they weren't fussy. Overnight, you got used to deer and raccoons and possums, rattlesnakes and songbirds and foxes, wild dogs and butterflies. Not long after that, you lost count of the hunters and anglers and campers and delinquent kids setting fire to things. I used to go to various stripper pits in Warwick County with my friend Shane in his 79 Chevy Silverado. His, still, his dad still keeps it running. Shane's dad is a poet. Hoosier poets aren't like other poets. Last time I saw him, the three of us pinned a beer can to a tree and threw knives at it all afternoon. Shane and I, with our scientifically balanced mail-order throwing knives, began to get the hang of it after a couple of hours. Shane's dad, a big man with a snowy beard that makes you think of Poseidon, stood 20 feet away with the rusty old kitchen chopper and he nailed it every time, underhand. Poets in New York and San Francisco can't do that. I think that was the line that made me really want to buy the book. <coughs> also, because I was like, what do you have against poets in New York and San Francisco? But also, just the amount that that says about that dude at that moment. Um, and so, it also to me says something a little bit about your opinion 
of of the people of Indiana, like Shane's dad, for some reason, says this to me. I just wanted to know: is am I just am I wrong in that? Is there is this praise for him, or is this is this not praise? Well, it was praised at the time I've, I wrote it, but there is actually a snowy bear dude who can do that. <laughs> and he hasn't read the book, so now I'm kind of cross with him. Um, yeah, and a, a little bit later, it says that this guy moved from Evansville, which is referred to in the book as this. If Indiana is the bastard son of the Midwest, Evansville is its snot nosed stepchild. <laughs> so this poet, this knife throwing, throwing poet, leaves. Evansville for Bloomington, which is a much more genteel and cultured place. Well, because nobody can really live in southern Indiana. That's the premise of the book, is that southern Indiana is unfit for human habitation. Well, we have the benefit of a lot of reviews now, a lot of which said, I think we may even have sold this as a, a love letter to the state of Indiana. And now I want to like recraft it as maybe a tough love letter to the state of Indiana. Is that true? Wh which, which do you feel? Uh, it's a country song and um, the dog won't shut up and the woman won't stay true and the pickup truck keeps breaking down but you love but them all but it's love <laughs> exactly um, that, and that's because I like this also this, this sort of idea that the BBC sent in a film crew and so here you are you're writing your book about Indiana from the UK were you in some way like this sort of a film crew going back to your own state and looking at it again through a new lens when you were writing about it, and then did you fall in love with it, or did you hate it afterwards? Well, uh, um, the first question, definitely. I was, I, I was in a documentary mindset that, you know, I had to explain this to people who had never even thought about thinking about Indiana, mm. and had to go into some detail, which I wouldn't have done if I were living there, and, you know. What was your workshop like? You're in, you're in a creative writing program, so he's writing, he's writing in a workshop, and you're presenting stories about Indiana to, I imagine, Brits, right? No, it's very international, actually. Um, huh. Uh, well, that's a sidetrack, but, so, but in any event, um, when you were doing this, did you find yourself re-falling in love with your state, or, or finding so you, were you like being repelled a little bit by it? That's a tough question to answer. When I was growing up there, I actually found it very romantic. There was a lot of crumbling infrastructure everywhere, and that does appear in Snapper. Um, and we would go build fires on the railroad tracks or on this old World War II shipyard when we were 16 and drink from some bottle purloined from somebody's parents. And it was great. Then I forgot how romantic I used to think it and started, <laughs> you know, I, I, I moved abroad, and everybody asked me if I knew Bobby Knight or they uh, asked if they or there were a lot of Indians in Indiana, uh, or, or they confused Iowa, Illinois, Idaho with Indiana, and I just came to accept the view that it's flyover country and not of any interest. Until, you know, there I was living in a, a bath, a UNESCO World Heritage City, and I was suddenly compelled to write about a desolate truck stop in southern Indiana. Right, actually, can you read a little bit from Nationwide? This is one of my favorite moments in the book as well, simply because um, another thing that I love about it is Brian's eye to um, things that are being noticed that might go unnoticed. Nationwide. The gypsy moth wasn't what you'd call roadworthy, but I kept her a wheel for a while. The radiator had two big cracks, and I discovered these in the middle of nowhere, so I plugged them with bread for my sandwich. Ten miles later, I had toast. After that, I kept an eight-gallon plastic canister in the passenger seat and refilled it every time I passed a lake. When necessary, I pulled over and poured lake water into the radiator along with a few tadpoles. I thought she could use the protein. I found other leaks of other fluids all over the underside of the truck, and I patched these up with duct tape or chewing gum, depending what I had on hand. At that time, I was crisscrossing Indiana counting birds for the Department of Natural Resources, and I generally had to make my repairs deep in the forest somewhere. You can use water for brake fluid, too. I promise. The other problem with the gypsy moth was her appearance. Lola had persuaded me one sunny Sunday that we should spray paint butterflies and fairies and mushrooms on the hood, roof, and sides. Across the top on both sides of the flatbed cover, she had written gypsy moth in gold glitter. This kind of thing was okay in university towns like Lafayette and Bloomington, but out in real Indiana, I might as well go around in a skirt. Also okay in Lafayette and Bloomington, by the way. 
I let her do it because I had my own remodeling plans. While she was painting, I put a wooden pallet in the back and a mattress on top of that. I was sure that in her new creation, she'd enjoy going out to watch birds with me. Then she met a potter with four motorcycles, but that is a different story. One afternoon, I was driving east away from Lincoln State Park and toward the town of Santa Claus. They wanted to call it Santa Fe, but the post office told them some other town had got there first. Bourbon whiskey may have played a role in the resulting town meeting, but this was 1825 and nobody knows for sure. Anyway, it was over 90 in the shade, which made the gypsy moth even thirstier than usual. She started knocking at me like an old washing machine about to scamper across the kitchen floor. I pulled up at a truck stop, the old-fashioned kind with a chrome-trimmed diner open 24 hours where they put the same stuff in your coffee mug they put in your gas tank. As it was so hot, I parked in the shade of a 30-foot concrete, concrete statue of St. Nick by the side of the highway across the forecourt from the diner. I popped the hood and hopped out with my lake water in hand. I got the radiator cap unscrewed and started to pour with an eye out for twigs or minnows, and then I heard flip-flops flapping on the asphalt. I stopped pouring. A plump woman in her 50s with bland hair and bland eyes was looking to speak to me. You got a leak, she said. I said that I did. Hold on right there, she said. I'll get you some eggs. I thought she must be making a joke about the weather. You could fry an egg on the engine block, that sort of thing. She didn't smile, though, just turned around and flip-flopped back to the diner. I could see there were no customers inside, and I guess she sat in there with the air conditioning on high, just waiting for people like me. There was nothing around but cornfields for several miles. The Michelin Guide to Indiana by Nathan Lockmuller is real short. Everything's flat, everyone's fat, and you can't buy beer on Sunday. That is all you need to know. But I admit that sometimes you do run across a colossal Santa Claus on the highway. Put these in, she said. She held a carton of six white medium chicken eggs out in my direction. Two or three to start. In where, I said. Your radiator, seal the leak. Sometimes you can just use paprika, but a real leak needs eggs. That bread had held up for 10 miles the first time, so I was inclined to try her eggs out. I thought that for future reference, I should find out which forest songbirds laid the best eggs for automotive repair. Do I crack it first? I picked the nearest egg out. It'll crack itself, but you could give it a hand, she said. You probably don't want the shell in there, though I don't suppose it would hurt. Lola can crack an egg perfectly on first try every time. It's a skill I've always admired. I wound up with half on top of the radiator and the other half over my hand. Try again, she said. I selected another and managed to drop its contents into the radiator. I wasn't sure what to do with the shells. I could see she kept the premises very clean. What else would she do out there? And dropping the shells might seem like littering. Another one, she said. I never heard of this, I said. She shrugged as if she expected as much. It's easy to see the egg will solidify as it boils, but how anyone figured out it will fill up a crack in the process is beyond me. We'd gotten four eggs in there, when a thin man in a greasy apron joined us outside. You don't look like a gypsy, he said. He had a sharp, stubbled chin and a permanent squint. I didn't know what he meant. It says gypsy moth, said the woman. You can throw them shells in the grass. I know what it says, the man replied. You ain't finished it, though, right? You're going for gypsy mother f Ernie, the woman interjected. <laughs> like truckers, Maud, he insisted. Everett's rig all done up with Ivan the Terrible and Kevin says Big Bishop. He was giving me the benefit of the doubt. You don't look like a gypsy, though, he repeated. Maud had begun inspecting the rest of the truck. You know, screws is cheaper than duct tape, she said. Muffler on this model is attached to a plate. It's supposed to be, anyway. I had the whole thing taped to the back bumper. I didn't have any screws, I said. I had assumed the whole thing needed a professional mechanic with heavy equipment. We probably got some that'll fit, she said. Ernie continued his efforts to be friendly. I like this girl with the boobs, he said, pointing at a mermaid on the side. Lola painted that, not me. Maud was on her knees looking underneath the truck. Her voice was remote, muffled. You got a band-aid over your gas line, she said. Couple of them. I was getting embarrassed. It leaked and I was miles from anything, I said. She stood up and shrugged. Just don't drive over an open flame. Tell you what, said Ernie. I'm glad to see a truck like this doing what she was built for. Lola's artwork lay under all kinds of grime and mud and forest grit, and the body was peppered with small dents from rogue gravel on country roads. That truck had even seen a tornado up close. Mostly these days they get waxed every Sunday so they can run to the mall twice a week. What line of work are you in? This, <coughs> this was always a tricky question. 
I'm a bird watcher was the sort of answer they might expect from a man who drove a truck called Gypsy Moth. It suggested that back home in Bloomington or Lafayette, I went around in a skirt. I should have made Lola name it Gypsy Queen or something. I'm a researcher, I said. Uh-huh, said Ernie. What do you research? Birds. That's real nice, he said. I wish I had a job like that. Let me ask you a personal question, said Maud. Bird watchers pay not enough to get your truck fixed? No, I said. Not really. Ernie can patch you up, she said. Better than you are now, anyhow. I patch anything up, said Ernie. Unless it's electronic. Don't hold with that kind of thing. This here is an honest truck. If you don't want to wait in the heat, come inside, said Maud. Ernie handed his apron to her, and I handed the keys to him. So, it, I think I actually already know the answer to this question, but there was at one point a gigantic Santa Claus by the side of the road. It's better than that. There were many. Oh. And are they still there? No, I, will, I, will, I just needed a drink. <laughs> the town of Santa Claus commissioned a larger statue every year for some number of years <laughs> throughout the 70s. And then when they got tired of the old ones, they would auction them off. So there were several gas stations throughout Indiana that just bought these things to, to draw in families, you know, with the kid, oh, let's go see Santa Claus and, and get them into the truck stop for conversation or food. And each one was a little bit bigger? Yes. <laughs> That's funny. I think they're, they're, they're pretty modest now, though. Mm. Um, and so, have you actually had, can you actually fix a radiator with cracked eggs as well? Not anymore. Radiators are all sealed. Um, so it beeps and you have to take it somewhere. But apparently, it, 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 you could for a long time. I never did. I learned about it six years ago when I had the bird watching job I did have a big canister of lake water and I would fill up the radiator and it would get me a couple of miles and then I'd have to fill it up again uh, so and I didn't have a truck I had a Cutlass Supreme well, that's funny um, well what goes what happens as this chapter progresses which is really fascinating and I don't want to just sit here and read but um, Nathan goes into this uh, goes into the truck stop and Santa Claus Turns out kids start sending, um, they think Santa Claus lives there, so they start sending other Christmas wish lists there, right? And this, this also, I imagine, is this something that you experience because the character starts writing letters back to the kids as Santa Claus, which is, again, one of my favorite moments? <laughs> um, or is this purely fictional? No, the town of Santa Claus does respond to uh, letters from children. Um, <laughs> The town of Santa Claus is also a very wealthy gated community. It's not a little truck stop in the middle of nowhere. So wow. you can kind of imagine the, the parent teachers association putting together a bake sale in which people respond to letters to Santa or something like that. I like these characters too, again, and, and characters sort of pop up and, and disappear. Lola, obviously Nathan and, and Gerald all reoccur. Um, but another thing, and I guess you kind of get it, a sense of this one when Brian is reading it, is this sort of, your sentences are generally very short for the most part, and you, you move quick. And I wanted to know, before you're sending things to me, how much, how much sort of revision are you doing to get things to move so fast? I think the dialogue, too, really pops. Do you sit with it for a while? There are two answers to that, actually. Um, one is that I wrote a bunch of plays, and uh, that's right. I yeah. learned to write dialogue by writing only dialogue for a year and a half. And before that, I, what I wrote was really sludge. Um, but then I, once I in had a different sense of comic timing and dialogue and scene setting, I could write this fairly quickly. Um, but I also, I, I often start with a kind of um, free verse, and then I'll, later I'll smudge it up into paragraph form, but I pay attention to cadence and rhythm, and, uh, alliteration, and so on. And it becomes the sort of thing that you would almost have to be Peter O'Toole to read out loud. And I, I you know, I'm kind of chrome trim diner open 24 hours is really difficult. I've to so I, I have to unpack it and make it less artificial sometimes. Mm. Um, That's interesting. I forgot, and wish I should remember <laughs> as your editor that you worked with, um, that you did write a fair bit of plays. And that was something that struck me when I was first reading it, too. And it's, it's interesting to be reminded of that sitting here now. Because, um, again, I think a lot of the reviews, which is interesting when you're working with the paperback or talking about the paperback, I think a lot of people picked up on that. Which actually, did you feel, was there anything, um, 
were you surprised at all about some of the things people latched onto or didn't latch onto? I mean, aside, I mean, everything was laudatory and great, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that when a actually do you pay attention to your reviews? Because some of others don't. Do. You do. Um, and B, were there any that that you felt, um, you know, maybe latched onto something you didn't expect? Well, uh, some blog somewhere called it a dark and charming elegy for a nation in decline. <laughs> <laughs> which may be my favorite but <laughs> I'm not sure what they were talking about uh, oh that's wonderful I'm happy that you told me <laughs> did, uh, did, did things in reviews jump out at you I um I was no I, I think that there the way that we presented it with the package for the hardcover which is also interesting because you could see the, the two different versions of it and how Josie publicist who's here somewhere how she pitched it um, I think it was excellent and it, I think that it, it did come off as this sort of magnifying lens to fly over country which was exactly what we wanted um, so we were delighted and, and in terms of uh, you know the accolades in terms of people tapping it for top tens or interesting little lists it just kept finding its ways um, onto this great things and I think you and I talked about this too as you think about Donald Ray Pollock or Frank Bill, and you think about this other Americana, this dark sort of Americana that's happening. Um, this is different, you know. It's <coughs> it's it. There's some darkness to it, but there's also this. Again, it's this sort of blend of love and hate. Because um, you read Frank Bill, what did you think of Frank Bill, right? Didn't you read um, Did you read Donnie Brook or no? Or I did you read I Crimes in Southern Indiana? I read Crimes in Southern <coughs> Indiana, and um, it. it it has its merits. Um, <laughs> it's different. It's a little more meth <laughs> and fighting. Yeah, I remember having conversations in England uh, with various people about, I didn't know of anyone who was writing um, a whole picture. There were all lots of little subcultures being described, but I wanted to take Lake Wobegon and a meth lab and some Klansmen and some really nice people who wrote letters to Santa Claus and just put them all in the same bag and shake it up and see what came out. Right. So I there's a, a variety in here that I, I was aiming for, which I think is less um, visible to me now in Indiana than it was when I was growing up. So Bloomington is very much a liberal college town and then outside there's a real tea party enclave and the two do not mix in ways that I think they might have had to more they had to shop in the same place mm. uh, 20 years ago that's interesting are you finding it uh, now that you're working on your next book for me <laughs> are, are you finding writing about Indiana now that you're living in it in, as opposed again from having the BBC binoculars on Oh, everybody predicted that I'd get here and I would just have to write about England, <laughs> um, which is not true, but I should warn you that <laughs> I do have this inkling, this urge to write about Prague. So, um, no, it's fascinating to me to note the differences um, in Indiana, but also the differences in my own uh, expectations after 10 years in Britain. I, I don't mind private citizens carrying guns, but why do the police have guns? That freaks me out. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, there used to be a, this migratory homeless population through uh, Bloomington, and now it's perennial. And mm. um, that seems to be, I, I went to Iowa City, and I, on one day, I uh, counted four incidents of cops harassing homeless guys in downtown. And I thought, okay, so every college town in America now has a big problem that it didn't used to have. So, And you mentioned, um, you know, like, Will Be Gone, or I think of Winesburg, Ohio, and um, were th you know? Were there other influences that were sort of hanging over you as you were writing this, or were you thinking of different writers that you've read in the past, or were you just sort of like, "It's my thing, I'm doing it." I, it you know, uh, Peter Taylor and Catherine Ann Porter are name checked in, in the back because they were the two who influenced me most when I was growing up. But after I had written this, I, I kept looking at it and and saying, "This doesn't remind me of anything that I ever admired." Mm. Um, which <laughs> um, until a year later and I kind of realized that the, the way that Nathan doesn't fully understand his experience and it makes him unhappy that he's kind of an unreliable narrator he doesn't understand Lola 
He doesn't understand what's happened to him, and he can't make sense of it. I think I picked all of that up from Peter Taylor. Um, that's a good. Uh, maybe read one more spot towards the end with Nathan, because I have a. I'm interested in whether Nathan is a happy or sad guy. I I go back and forth between it. Um, but we'll read. You know, t- look at one more short section in the back, and then maybe uh, if there is some time for questions, if anybody has one, we could we could do that quickly. Which section? Um, I would love for you to read the part with the park ranger, but I think you had other no, other moments, and which starts on. Uh, oh, to, up to flashlight. Yeah. Yeah, two oh seven starts. Uh, so uh, Nathan is out in the woods with. Um, his pregnant girlfriend and she falls down and twists her ankle. There was a compact black Jeep with the DNR logo on the door parked outside and a light shining through the station's windows. Several plank steps led up to a flimsy wooden cabin. Clearly Annie couldn't climb these. I helped her sit on the bottom step and ran up to the door. My girlfriend's pregnant. She's twisted her ankle, I said as I entered. A ranger at a small rickety desk stared at me. He didn't speak, didn't even lay down the pen in his hand. My girlfriend's pregnant, I began again. I heard you, he said calmly. He was in his early twenties, I guessed, but what struck me was how clean he seemed, as though he had shaved and moisturized his sharp dimpled chin five minutes before, gotten his fine brown hair clipped and his nails manicured that morning. His shorts, shirts, and even his socks looked freshly ironed. They had never deviated from the straight line between the driver's seat of the Jeep and the folding metal chair he perched on, and his boots did not often forsake carpet for concrete, let alone gravel. Maybe you ought to marry her, he said. What? I couldn't quite take that in. Since you got her pregnant. Look, she twisted her ankle, I said. I heard you, he said. He rose slowly and deliberately from his chair. She's outside, I added. He crossed the room to a metal cabinet and fetched a set of keys from his pocket. Her parents know? She's not 16, for God's sake. He paused to glare at me, and I supposed that I had taken the Lord's name in vain. Then he unlocked the cabinet and extracted a plastic box marked First Aid. You should marry her, he said, walking past me. He was very kind to Annie. Let me look at that ankle, ma'am, he said, crouching at the bottom of the steps. My name's Wayne. I'll get a band-aid for your forehead, too. Are you hurt anywhere else? Annie held up her hands. I'm worried about the baby, she said. I fell on my front. I wouldn't worry, ma'am, he said, taking a confident and expert hold of her ankle. By the look of your hands, I don't think there was much weight left for the baby to take. I've got bandages for them, too. He began to press on her skin. I feel some swelling, he said, and he breathed in sharply. I don't think you broke anything, he said. You may have torn a ligament, though. Need an expert to tell you that. He turned to me. How'd y'all get out here? My car is at the start of the 10 o'clock line. That's awkward, he said. It was only three miles away on foot, but closer to 10 by road. The Jeep has only got two seats, he added. I didn't know what to do. I want to get Peach checked out, said Annie. I can lend you a flashlight, said Wayne. Uh, I've always liked that because you have Nathan, we're with Nathan this whole book, and he, he, you really want to like him, but he, he fucks up a lot. And then you get this park ranger who comes on the scene for two pages, and it's kind of a dick. But he's also like a really nice dick. Like he's a really nice, polite asshole. And he stayed with me. All this time, I always go back to him and somehow he wins. Like he wins that scene. Um, and I just, I mean, is that, the, the, it's again that sort of sense of character. Um, that again, is that somebody that you sort of, is there a lot of folks like that out in, in Old Flyover Country that you would feel? Were you trying to say something by writing him that way, that page? I don't know. There's something about their interaction that I just love. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, sure, there are a lot of good folks out there, and uh, but a big part of the way the book works is Nathan constantly discovering what an idiot he's been. Yes. So it, he decides that Maud is, uh, who, whom we met earlier at the truck stop, is uh, one sort of person, and then he turns out to be wrong, and that happens, that recurs throughout the book. Right. And in the end, he's kind of exiled from Indiana permanently um, having never really appreciated it right um, if you want to ask some questions do you want to use the mic for questions as well here does anybody have any questions tonight for Brian okay. I'm bring you the microphone 
Um, mine is more of a request, actually. Um, when you're just talking about the characters that you know teach Nathan something that he realizes he you know should have known before, my favorite character, as you know, is the is his Texan uncle, and um, how Nathan thinks for the you know that whole story about him that he's just this miserable racist. Um, but then when he finds out more about him and more of what his experience has been moving to Indiana from from Texas, he realizes he's not such a bad guy after all. Um, so I was wondering if you could read that last little portion of that story where. He talks about being, um, he talks about the shooting and um, how the yeah. family is most important. While I try to find it, I'll just explain that um, my next book is going to be called Fifty Shades of Redneck. <laughs> <laughs> and what I wanted to do w with bringing the Texan to Indiana was illustrate that, uh, because Indiana does have this t terrible history of white supremacy, you know, and just wanted to illustrate that it's not all one giant block of awful where, where did I read that Indiana is the south's middle finger I need to appropriate it for the, <laughs> my next book <laughs> so, alright uh, so I should explain that the Texan uncle moves to Indiana and uh, puts a whites only sign up on his front porch which he claims is a relic of his childhood and a joke but then the local clan tries to recruit him and then he goes out and tells them something. We never really find out what. But Loretta is the aunt's name and Dart is the uncle. Loretta was in the house when Dart returned and I was on the front porch holding that 38 just to see if I could get used to it. I suppose she didn't hear him because she didn't join us. He explained that he had been to see the judge. What did you say, I asked. He didn't answer. Come on, he said. Let me show you how to use that. He took me out to shoot tin cans, not turtles. I sold the gun to a pawn shop, shop a week later, but I did enjoy that afternoon. Squeeze the trigger, don't pull it, he said. I was hopeless and hit about one in five. He shot left-handed and didn't miss. You gonna bury that sign, I said. Done that already. What exactly did you tell them? First they wanted to know if I was affiliated and I said I was not. Then they asked if I would like to be affiliated and I said I would not. They asked me to clarify my views on certain subjects and I told them to mind their own business. They thought you had made your views pretty plain. Only Yankees have views. Texans aren't that self-righteous. There was no point arguing a proposition like that with Dart. Well, what did you say to the judge, I asked. I promised him fried songbird, he said. At least tell me what you said, I insisted. I clarified my views like they asked. I said nothing but nothing matters to me except my family. I thought he was bound to miss the next shot under the influence of all that sincerity, but the last tin can proved me wrong. Set up some more, he said. Wonderful. Do you have any other questions out there this evening? Got one in the back. So, uh, is there something just inherently funny about people who watch birds? You know, here we have Duck Dynasty <laughs> and, and uh, you know, real hunting culture. But, you know, people who just go out and, you know, if they're not hiking or snowmobiling, they're just out there, you know, watching and enjoying birds. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what is it? I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> and this gets me in trouble when sometimes I give readings to groups of birders, you know, and, and, and they're, they're not just birders, they're competitive birders. <laughs> uh, so I, I have to try to find line there. It's, it's nice to admit that I think it's fine. I don't really... I had to do a lot of homework after I wrote this book, but I wasn't, yeah. I don't really watch birds myself, is what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Well, that's about all the time we have for this evening. On behalf of The Strand, thank you guys so much for being here, Brian and Tim. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and have a lovely evening. Thanks. Thank you.